Hi, this is John Mitchell from Lonely Robot. I've got a new album out called Please Come Home. You are watching Morrow.com. Well, the simple answer is because uh, we were working on another It Bites album and it, it wasn't really going very well. Or, well, I mean, I wasn't really happy with the stuff that I was coming up with. We did that Map of the Past album and I thought I was really proud of that album. So, um, I don't know what it felt like. We were kind of just going through the motions or, or writing. I'd still gone back to writing. The trouble with when you write an album for It Bites is I'm very conscious of it, it having to sound to a certain degree like the sound of It Bites in the past, which is probably not the best way to, to write music. But after we did Map of the Past and it felt like we were sort of getting away from what It Bites used to sound like to a certain degree. And then, um, I don't know, the stuff that we'd, we were writing, uh, it just, in the middle of last year, I just wasn't really happy with it. And then Fish called up, um, Fish called me up and said, uh, could he have John Beck's phone number? Because um, he needed a keyboard player. So I said, yeah, there's for John Beck's phone number. John Beck kind of went off on tour with Fish for a very long time. And I thought, why? What should I do instead? So I decided to do it there. I've been meaning to do it for a couple of years, to be honest with you, but that was a good excuse to do it. Basically, you know, I, you know um, in the absence of uh, John, I decided to go and do my own thing. Floating high above the ground Not very long at all. If, you know, if I can... If I consolidated all the time that I spent recording it into sort of one continuous period, it probably would have been no more than about three weeks to write and record it. Didn't take long. No more all. than three weeks. No, I don't. I, I, I hate. I hate taking too long doing anything. I'm very impatient. So, you know, uh, I kind of like to get up in the morning, record all day, and then by about nine o'clock at night, there's a finished song. That's the way I like to work. It doesn't take long. The, the, you know, the, the, the most time-consuming thing is waiting around for the guest people to send in their parts, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of... Uh, I had to wait a little while for Nick Kershaw to do his guitar solo. Uh, but, yeah, no, on the whole, it was... And, yeah, I, I think the, the thing that held up the end of it was I was still waiting for something from Jem. Jem had to do uh, one more bit on the first song. But apart from that, yeah, it didn't take long at all. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't want to do another Kino album. Um, I think the trouble with the Kino thing was I was a bit naive at the time as to, as to uh, you know, how these things work. I think, you know, I was so fully dedicated to it and, you know, I've got, I have to be realistic and I'm not being, I don't mean this in a, in, a, in a mean way, but I think for, like for example, Pete Travis, it's kind of, it was more of a distraction, you know, just, a, just a, like, you know, a thing on the side, you know, um, when he wasn't doing, you know, Marillion. Um, but Marillion is a busy band, and they spend an awful lot, awful lot of time in the studio writing albums and recording albums, and then they spend a lot of time on tour. So the amount of time left over to do something like Kino uh, was, was fairly negligible, and I wanted to sort of tour it a lot more. I found that we were saying no to gigs. We'd been offered gigs and, and supports and tours and stuff. We had to say no to because Pete wasn't available. And plus the fact that Chris Maitland, who I, you know, when I originally did it, I wanted it, I knew I wanted to be involved in the project. I definitely wanted Chris Maitland, I definitely wanted John Beck, and I definitely wanted Pete Travis. And I, it's kind of, it's either that lineup or not at all. And Chris Maitland went off, he kind of, he couldn't commit to, to doing it. In fact, after, literally after he re finished recording his drums, he decided that he couldn't commit to it and went off to the West End um, to earn a living doing session drumming which I fully understand. I kind of, in a way, I kind of would have preferred to have known that before we started recording. Otherwise, I, you know, I would have found, probably, maybe found, try to find somebody else that would have, was a bit more flexible. But anyway, um, yeah, it, it kind of fell apart before it, it really even started, in, in my opinion. And then it sort of turned into it bites. So I see, I, I see no reason to do another one. And, I mean, <laughs> as arrogant as this might sound, I pretty much wrote most of the music anyway. So, you know, uh, just doing under uh, the title Lonely Robot, you know, I mean, it's not exactly the same sort of music because you don't have the influence of John Beck and, and, and those guys, but, you know, for the most part, you know, it, 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 if you're the chief songwriter, it doesn't matter what you call it, you know, that's my opinion on, on the subject anyway.
Um, and I, you know, I think Lonely Robot sounds a bit more interesting than John Mitchell. And there's already a Joni Mitchell, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not vain enough to have to feel like, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm ha- I, I like the name Lonely Robot. I always knew it was going to be called Lonely Robot. And um, I think the illusion that Thomas Varber at Inside Out wanted to create was that it's, it's sort of a band in that there are some fixed musicians who contributed to it because he thinks that bands sell more units than solo albums, which may or may not be true, but I don't mind. I, I have no objection to calling it Lonely Robot. I, I like the name. It sounds a hell of a lot more interesting than my name anyway. Yeah, it's interesting, but <coughs> where does it come from? It comes from a, uh, a song lyric. Um, Sting has got a daughter who's called Coco, and well, her nickname is Coco. Uh, her real name's Elliot, Elliot Sumner. And she uh, had a, a, a project that she was working on called I Blame Coco was the name of, of the project. And she had a song in there called Self Machine and the, the chorus lyric featured the words Lonely Robot. Lonely Robot in a Harbour, I think the lyric was. Lonely Robot in a Harbour, rusting in the ocean's water, which was a really strange lyric. And I just really like, I, I, I nicked it from there. So yeah, I nicked Sting's daughter's lyric from my band name. The recurring themes of the album are yeah. basically, I don't think, and this might sound a bit odd, but I don't think that human beings necessarily originate from this planet. Or at the very least, I think we're a, a, a hybrid species between something that came from elsewhere and maybe something that was already here, but I don't think we entirely originate from this planet. Which seems a bit weird, maybe, but that's my belief. Because I don't, I mean, you know, I think that you, every other creature that exists on this planet is not at odds with its environment, whereas human beings are completely at odds with their environment, you know. And uh, no other creature is so patently self um, self-destructive and destructive towards the environment that lives in as human beings, as human beings, rather. So, I mean, and then there, there's lots of other things, I believe, that tie in with that. Ideal, but that's basically it. Another dream that we forgot, wishing on the pale blue dot. You see, there's a lot of them out there. They're secret. They're 80s pop stars who are secretly prog heads. There's lots of them. Well, you didn't see Nick Beggs. You didn't see that coming, did you? Nick Beggs from Kajagoogoo is now the sort of the go-to um, bass player. You know, from the you know everybody wants to work with him, and he's a secret prog head. I mean, there's lots of them. You know. Um, actually, I would say though, Peter Cox doesn't like progressive rock at all. So <laughs> that's the. Uh, that, but you know, certainly Nick Kershaw. He said to me actually, he, the next album that he's working on is going to be more of a, a progressive rock kind of album. Um, I think you know he's uh, he's finally given into the inner need to uh, to be experimental. You know, but Nick, you know, if you listen to his music, it's not straight ahead pop music. There's like more chord changes and key changes than you can ever imagine. You know. It's not just three chord, you know, all the other songs are like just three chords that, you know, they're incredibly intelligently well-written songs. And I think, you know, that comes from his sort of, uh, his, his love of progressive rock. I think, you know, there is a certain amount of experimentation in, in the way he arranges things. And he's just a, I think the thing most people don't realize is what an absolutely brilliant guitar player is, because it gets overlooked because he's like this guy from the, from the 80s who back in the 80s was like a pinup, you know, he was a, you know, this dude who was kind of just like a pop star, but he is an absolutely brilliant guitar player. And I remember thinking, I kind of put this guitar solo down. There is actually a version on the extended version of the album where I do the guitar solo, but I kind of, I just wanted something a bit more interesting in that song. And he certainly did that. You know, he's a brilliant guitar player. Steve Hogarth, um, I've known Steve Hogarth a very long time. I supported Marillion, um, just me on a, an acoustic guitar. I supported him a bunch of times. And then we did a, It Bites did a charity record. We re-recorded Calling All The Heroes um, for the Cumb- Cumbrian flood. There was a f- big flood in Cumbria. And um, yeah, we wanted to do a charity record to help out because all the, the guys from It Bites from Cumbria. And Steve Hogarth from Cumbria as well. So we kind of, he wanted to get involved in it as well. So we did this and he guested on it. And I've just got to know him over the years, you know, and we, we've become very good friends. And um, so, yeah, I invited him over and 
Yeah, he played the piano, and everyone's going, "Oh, well, how come you? Uh, how come he, uh, you've got him singing backing vocals? Isn't that a bit rude?" You know, Steve Hogarth, the great Steve Hogarth, singing backing vocals. I'm like, well, <laughs> truth be told, I didn't actually want him to sing backing vocals. I didn't well, not want him to. I didn't get him over to sing backing vocals. I got him over to play piano because he's a, a brilliant pianist, and I, I know him to be a really brilliant pianist. But again, that gets overlooked because you know he's this fantastic singer, but he's also an absolutely wonderful pia piano player. He's got a wonderful, delicate touch on the piano. But he was there, and he's a, he's a singer, and there was a microphone, and he goes, you know what, John, I've got this brilliant idea for a backing vocal. Can't, do you mind if I record it? I'm like, no, okay, Steve, go and sing your backing vocal. <laughs> no, and I was grateful, because it's what, you know, what he did was brilliant, but it, it's not like I was, I didn't get him to, I didn't book him to sing backing vocals to make myself look good or anything. I kind of just, he wanted to do it, so there you go. I want to do another album as soon as I get back off to it. I just want to start writing again. I really enjoyed it. I, it's, um, it, it's, it was such an enjoyable thing to do, and I'm, I'm so proud of it. It's just, on, on, you know, just everything about it. And it's, uh, you know, I, you know, touch wood. Um, most people I meet seem to really like it, so I want to just do another one. You know, it's, it's something I should have probably done. I think when I was um, 16 years old, I used to spend a lot of time in my bedroom, um, you know, learning to how to record stuff and messing around with a four-track tape recorder. And I used to find it fascinating. I was, I, you know, there was a sense of wonderment about it, you know. And I kind of recaptured some of that enthusiasm that I used to have, which I haven't had for many years, to be honest with you. Um, I think, and I hate to say this to the detriment of it bites, but if you're sitting in a room working with somebody, worrying about whether it sounds like it bites, then that's the beginning of, of the end of, of you know of, of Ryan really. I think that uh, music should be should take you wherever it takes you, and you shouldn't have to worry about trying to fit into a bracket to please somebody or to to, to, to appeal yourself to a fan base. And I think that's pretty much what I did with the uh, the Lonely Robot thing was I just did whatever came into my head, and I'm I'm really proud of it. Can you build a city, you flatten all you see. See, here's the thing, right? I mean, I had such an enthusiasm for doing it that I, I don't want to, to spoil that enjoyment by doing a bunch of, I hate to say, use the word, crappy gigs. <laughs> See, with a, um, with, with a tour like this long tour that we've just been on, um, there's, there are obviously some great gigs, some highs, and then there are lows where you get badly attended gigs, and it can be very demoralising. But I understand, you know, from a cost point of view, you have to do more gigs to make the tour pay for itself but I'm not really interested in, in, in doing a great long tour with Lonely Robot I, you know not I'm not at that at the level that it would be at I mean if I do a couple more albums and you know it becomes more popular then perhaps I'll consider it but um, I, I you know because it's quite a, a big sounding album and it's quite cinematic sounding the last thing I want to do is play it in a pub <laughs> to 20 people so I am doing two gigs at the end of the year. I'm doing one at the Scala in London and I'm doing one at the Borderai. Um, and hopefully some people turn up for those. But, you know, it's just an experiment to see, you know, whether they're... I mean, it did very well. It's done very well. It got in the charts in, in the United Kingdom. It got on the album charts. And it got to number seven in the rock charts. So it's, it's done very well. So <clears throat> I think it's a good start. It's a, it's a great start. For, you know, and the launch party was a great success and it was really great. And I've had a lot of support from people like my... Uh, friend Steve Wilson, he's been very supportive of it. He thinks that he really likes the album, you know. Uh, um, so I just see, I'll just do another one and, and see how it goes, and, and hopefully uh, more people buy the next one. You know, I think if you're true to yourself, I think people, um, I think people can, can. I think, as I say, if you do, if you if you make an album that you would love, there's a good chance. And I haven't got the world's worst taste in music, so it's a good chance other people might like it as well. I've got a band that I've already put together, Craig Blundell. Um, yeah. Hopefully, he hasn't. I've told him the dates. I've told him to write them in his diary. So he's he's actually going off on tour with Steve Wilson in about a week's time. Uh, he's doing the American dates because Marco Miniman can't do the American dates. So he's taking over. I, I actually um, name dropping. I actually I actually got in the gig with Steve Wilson. So uh, <laughs> that's uh, you know. I, it's, uh, that worked out quite well, you know. Uh, Steve was looking for a drummer, and he asked me if I knew anybody, and I said, "Well, what about the guy on the Lonely Robot album?" Because yeah, he's really good. So that's kind of now he's doing the, the tour, the tour, the US tour with Steve. It's who you 
It was, sorry? It's through you. It's through me. I made it happen, man. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he's doing off that. But anyway, yeah, so Craig's going to be on drums. My friend Liam Holmes, uh, he's a fantastic keyboard player. You don't have to be a fantastic keyboard player to do Lonely Robot because I played all the keyboards and I'm not that great on the keyboards. But he's doing, uh, he's going to be covering all the other stuff that, that I can't play on, on the one guitar. And my friend Caroline Campbell, who's a, she's, um, she's a bass player. She plays for Hugh Cornwall and she played for Cradle of Filth. I think she played keyboards for Cradle of Filth. And <clears throat> she played, um, I think she might have sang backing vocals with Annika Van Geers. Is that how you pronounce it? Annika Van Geers? Yep. Gentle Storm Lady, I think she sung backing vocals for her for a while. But she's a brilliant bass player and um, a really good friend of mine, so I'm gonna get her. And it's you know, and you know, and she's you know, gentle on the eye, which is nice with the prog guys, right? <laughs> oh, we can't be-